Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading today comes from Jude, verses 5 through 16. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. This is the word of the Lord. In order to recognize counterfeit or false money, federal agents start their training not by studying the countless examples of false currency that is out there, but by studying what true real dollar bills look like, what they feel like, how they reflect in the light, all the different contours and details that are added in to show that it's real. The idea is that these agents are never going to be able to know all the endless ways to create false money, The possibilities there are endless. Instead, what they need is to be intimately acquainted with the true dollar bill so when the false thing comes around, they can recognize it because they know what's true. In the same way, the book of Jude tells us that our best defense as a church against false and counterfeit Christianity is a good offense. A Christianity that knows our Savior intimately and walks with him in true Christian living. So for this very reason, Jude starts and ends his letter uh, with the glorious good news of the gospel, and yet in between the good news of Jesus saving us in the beginning and the good news that Jesus will keep us to the end, Jude has some really hard news about false Christianity in the middle. In fact, Jude says, if you look at verse 4, that he was eager to write to the church about the gospel, and yet... He found it necessary to write this middle section because certain people had crept into the church unnoticed, living an ungodly and false version of Christianity. So church, I was really eager to share the good news of the gospel with you last week, and honestly, I can't wait until next week to share two verses that I think are probably two of the most beautiful verses in all of scripture, and yet this morning, I, along with Jude, find it necessary to share with you verses 5 through 16. Because although this section is riddled with condemnation and controversy and verses that are frankly really difficult to interpret, all scripture is inspired by God. It's all profitable for our good. Even hard passages like the one before us today. Often especially hard passages like the one about false living that we're looking at today. 
So every year, my dermatologist cuts off another mole from my body to check for melanoma because of my family history and my love for being out in the sunshine during the summer. And every year, my dermatologist says, if the test results in good news, then you'll get an email. And if the test results in bad news, Joe, you're going to get a personal phone call. The section of Jude that we're in today is a personal phone call. It's not your regularly scheduled good news email, but it's a serious warning that should grab your attention and make you gravely aware of the kind of false Christianity that would condemn you to hell. The temptation as we hear this section of scripture today is going to be to think that this is about those people. To think about how one of our relatives or maybe the person sitting a few rows in front of you might be one of those people who needs to hear this. But friends, Jude didn't write this passage primarily to those people. He writes it to you. As you read through the first five verses of Jude, you notice the word you is repeated over and over. It says you believers, you church people, you, you, you. Jude doesn't write to attack those people and to just pile up condemnation on them. No, in relation to those people, Jude is going to be clear that his goal is that they'd be shown the mercy of Jesus Christ. Rather, Jude writes this horrifying section of scripture to you and to me. He wants to convince us that the false living in our lives, the sin that we struggle with despite knowing Jesus is extremely serious, so serious that we must be building up one another in the faith constantly lest we find one day that we were merely playing Christianity all while a hidden sin pattern of false living reveals that we never truly knew Jesus. So whatever sin pattern you might be tempted to struggle with today, whether you are experiencing great victory in that temptation or great failure, or maybe something in between this morning, Jude wants you to be thinking of your own propensity toward false living, and he wants you to do three things today. He wants you to remember it, to recognize it, and to repent of it. First, remember. Remember the penalty for false living. Remember the penalty for false living. Back in high school, I had this friend who would always slack off in his work at the beginning of the semester. Maybe you had this friend too. Then he'd get a midterm grade in the middle and he was not pleased with that. So then inevitably he'd work really hard to try to bring it back up, but it wouldn't get where he wanted it to go. Right? You know that friend. And then that would happen to him semester after semester after semester. He knew it was going to happen, yet he chose somehow in the moment not to remember that at the beginning of each semester. So we can be with our sin. We know the penalty for sin. And yet we somehow choose not to remember that penalty in the moment of temptation. Look at verse 5. Jude says, So I want to remind you, meaning you Christians, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. This is the first of three Old Testament examples that Jude gives to remind the church of the penalty of false living. And in this example, false living looks like lack of trust, lack of belief, and it results in the penalty of being destroyed. Now, this is not a lack of believing or trusting God in the past for salvation, but a lack of trust that God will provide in the present or into the future. After all, If you know the story, which I'm sure you do, God's people, the Israelites, uh, were saved out of Egypt through the miracle of the ten plagues, the ten plagues, and then they crossed the Red Sea on dry land by trust in God, or maybe it was just fear of the Egyptians chasing them, they were running for their lives, but they crossed the Red Sea on foot with massive walls of water on either side, they trust God to that end, then they get to the edge of the promised land, and their spies say, these people are too much for us to conquer. They're like giants. We're like grasshoppers. That's literally what they said. These people who crossed the Red Sea on their feet didn't trust God enough to then give them victory into the promised land that he told them to go to, and they're destroyed for it. 
Danny Aiken, president of Southeastern Seminary, applies this passage and says, the issue for them and the issue for us is this. Are you trusting God today? Are you trusting God now? Not once does the word of God tell us to look back to a past experience for our security. Paul says, rather, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, present tense, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Remembering the severe penalty that the Israelites paid for their lack of trust, even after being saved out of Egypt, should cause us to examine our own propensity toward false living. Second example, look at verse 6. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, God has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Whew. Now, this is the first of a couple of really interesting stories in the book of Jude. Some people take this as simply referring to the fact that angels rebelled against God and therefore they are kept in eternal chains of gloomy darkness until that final day. Other people uh, see this as a little more interesting because we know that demons are, not all demons, are kept in eternal chains right now. Like they are still around and also uh, another difference in this text is that the uh, next part of the text implies that these angels were somehow sexually immoral. So therefore, many Christian scholars take this text as referring to a very disturbing event uh, in early human history that's referred to in Genesis 6 when they say fallen angels chose to sin by having sexual relations with human women. Really creepy. It's not something we have to worry about because what's clear is that these demons are kept in eternal chains already under gloomy darkness. But how matter, no matter how you take the story, the point is not to debate over what we don't know about it. The point is to consider that we all have areas of our lives where our hearts want to rebel against the authorities over us. And yet Jude reminds us that the ultimate penalty even for inward rebellion against authority is eternal chains of darkness. Remember, false living results in destruction, eternal chains of gloomy darkness, and third, eyes on verse 7, Sodom and Gomorrah, third example, and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Now this story comes from Genesis 19, where uh, the men of Sodom were demanding to have homosexual relations with angels who came to visit a man named Lot, who they were going to save before the city of Sodom was destroyed for their sin. Now, some people argue that because of the previous reference in verse 6 to angels, that the sin of Sodom was not actually homosexual relations, but instead the problem was merely a desire for sexual relations with angels. And to be clear, that is definitely wrong too. But to be extra clear, there are many things wrong with this argument to try to delete homosexuality from this passage of Scripture. One of the issues we'll stick with is that the men in Genesis 19 didn't even know that these men visiting Lot were angels. If you look at verse 19.5 in Genesis, it says, They say, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. The issue was homosexuality. I want you to be aware of this little attempt in this text that people make to delete homosexuality because there's this big push in culture right now to reinterpret all scriptures about homosexuality, to delete it from the Bible or to reinterpret it in order to justify culturally acceptable desires. One argument that you're going to hear if you've not heard already is that people will say the Bible condemns homosexual lust, they'll agree there, but then they'll say that the Bible is silent regarding committed, monogamous, homosexual marriage. Therefore, the argument is that homosexual marriage is okay. However, this utterly misunderstands and twists what the Bible actually teaches. When you look at Romans 1, Genesis 2, other epistles, along with Jude right here, make it clear that homosexuality, verse 7, 
is an unnatural desire. The Bible says it's contrary to God's good design in nature for marriage between one man and one woman. And this text makes it clear that pursuing unnatural desire, as Jude says, is itself sinful. So, if merely pursuing a desire that is contrary to God's good design is sinful, then it doesn't matter how committed a couple is or is not while they pursue that desire. The Bible is clear that homosexuality, whenever pursued, is sinful. But this text doesn't just mention homosexuality. It says pursuing sexual immorality, porneo in the Greek of any kind, is sinful. Pornography use, sex outside of marriage, even looking at a woman with lustful intent in your heart, Jesus says, are in this same bucket as Sodom and Gomorrah's homosexuality. It is all false living which results in the penalty of eternal fire. So friends, don't make the mistake of thinking of someone else's sin right now. Think of your own propensity toward false living As you hear the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, when he names us all in a list of sinners and says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral of any kind, nor idolaters, that's all of us, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. So friends, remember the penalty for false living, destruction, eternal chains, eternal fire, and with trembling, let this drive you to obey and to pursue your Lord Jesus Christ. Remember. Second, recognize. Recognize the pattern of false living. Recognize the pattern of false living. This is by far the largest section of our text today. Jude is going to take off like a machine gun and rapid fire 12 examples of patterns of what it looks like when someone thinks they're a Christian, but really their life is marked by false living. There are so many examples because false living can take on so many different forms. So just because you don't identify with one or two of these or all 12, Uh, doesn't mean you aren't living a false Christianity. So Jude's going to give us three actions, three Old Testament examples, and then six examples from nature that help us recognize the pattern of false living. First, three actions. Look at verse 8. Jude says, In like manner, these people also, so that's an important transitional phrase first. He's saying that these false people in the church are like the people of Israel, who didn't trust God, they're like Sodom and Gomorrah in what their penalty is going to be. Obviously, there's not a one-to-one correlation in every situation, but they're like them. Also, when they are relying on their dreams, the text says. Uh, Not that all dreams are false. That's not what the text is saying. Dreams can be God-given and even helpful. But if you're relying on your dreams or a podcast or a book or anything else to interpret Scripture for you rather than relying on Scripture to interpret everything else in life, that's going to lead you down a bad path. And this dangerous path, verse 8, can lead to defiling the flesh. That's the first action recognized as false living. Defiling the flesh, of course, refers to homosexuality or sexual immorality in general, which many people lie about to themselves to excuse in their minds, right? You think, well, God has given me these desires, these dreams, and therefore it should be okay for me to act on them, even if I'm not yet married or if it's not with my spouse or if it goes against God's design, And of course, Jude recognizes these actions in the pattern of false living. Second action is they reject authority. Certainly, this can include rejecting human authorities. However, the word authority here is the word kyriotes, which comes from the same word as Lord in the Greek, which is kyrios. And Jude has already mentioned earlier in, in the text Uh, The idea that these people reject Jesus as Lord by how they live. So Jude's repeating that whereas false people may accept Jesus and seem to follow him with all of their theology, their secret and hidden lives would reveal that they don't 
follow Jesus as Lord with their works. Now, this can be confusing to some people, so allow me to try to simplify it by sharing a little spiritual math equation uh, from one of the pastors that I've served under. So, think of it like this. Many religions believe that the gospel is, the Christianity is hearing the good news of the gospel, there it is, plus responding to that good news, which equals being a Christian, well, that's not right. There's a different slide. <laughs> the, the, we, we should have gotten these in order. I apologize. So anyways, let's switch, switch the next one here. <clears throat> yeah, that's the first one. There it is. There it is. So, so that's what a lot of, of religions and people believe, that Christianity is you hear the gospel, plus you have the response, plus you have good deeds, and therefore, if your deeds are good enough, that will equal salvation for you. But we know that that's not true Christianity because the Bible's clear that you're saved by grace. Nothing you do can save yourself. You're saved by what Jesus has done for you. So we fix it to the one that only has three, and we get a better picture of Christianity uh, when you understand that it is the gospel plus a right response of repentance and faith equals Christianity. Then you're saved. That's a lot better. However, as Jude and the entire New Testament makes clear, you can know the gospel and show some type of evidence of responding to it, have those two parts of the equation looking good, and yet it can equal a false Christianity shown by your living because you are deceived. So, this equation is still missing something that could help us be more clear. Next slide, a more accurate version of Christianity would be this. Hearing the gospel plus responding to it equals being a Christian plus growing in good works. So you could remember how this works by the phrase saving grace works, right? Because saving grace works to make you a Christian. You're saved by grace alone, but then that grace works to create good works in your life because the same power that saved you is the power that helps you grow in Christian living. Saving grace works. Thanks, guys. But when the regular pattern of your life instead rejects Jesus as Lord by your actions, you show evidence that you might not truly be saved. So by way of application today, if you are wrestling with or struggling with, man, am I truly saved, do I have assurance of salvation, then your homework application for today would be to go home and just slowly read through the book of 1 John, because that book is like a little question and answer to help you identify whether you are in the faith. That's the purpose of that book, that you may know that you are in Christ. Verse 8, the third action of false people, they blaspheme the glorious ones. This phrase, glorious ones, refers to angels. It could refer to uh, demons as well, fallen angels or good angels. Most likely, Jude is referring not simply to saying bad words to blaspheme angels, though that's not a good idea either, but he's probably referring to rejecting the authority that angels have as guardians of God's law. So Acts 7 says angels delivered the law. Galatians 3 says that God's law was put in place by angels. So false living can look like blaspheming angels by disobeying God's law. Well, all right. Verse nine, eyes there. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. (laughs) Wow. Two things going on there. One, in contrast to false Christians who blaspheme angels by disobeying the law, the archangel Michael, the most powerful angel who the book of Revelation says is in the final days going to be in a battle against the devil himself, and Michael's going to win. And Michael doesn't even blaspheme the devil. Second thing going on here is Jude's quoting some kind of apocryphal source that is not a part of Scripture, right? So this story about the devil and Michael fighting about the body of Moses is not going to be found anywhere in the Bible. Rather, it's found in an apocryphal book called The Assumption of Moses. And later, Jude's also going to quote in our passage another apocryphal book called The Book of Enoch. Now, Maybe Jude is only quoting these books in the same way that Paul quoted pagan philosophers, that he's quoting them in order to connect with something that his audience knows, and he's bringing the truth in that way. 
But it also seems like Jude's quoting these extra biblical sources as if to say, look, church, God's truth can be used even from questionable sources. But the question is this. Do your actions make you a questionable source even when you are speaking God's truth? Verse 10. False people blaspheme all that they do not understand. And they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. So false people may think that they understand the hidden things of God, but really what Jude is saying that they do understand is they only understand the base sexual instinct of animals. Ouch. Those are three actions. Now three Old Testament examples that pattern false living. First, verse 11 Keep with me in the text. It says they walked in the way of Cain, who was, by the way, the first murderer. The Jude is not saying that all false people are murderers, but it means that they can be marked by anger and jealousy toward other people. John MacArthur says Cain was a religious man. He sacrificed to God, but he was disobedient. And when God did not accept his offering, Cain decided in jealous anger to murder his obedient brother. Cain's example shows that jealousy and anger, even in, especially in religious people, can be a, an omen that there's false living going on underneath. Second example, Balaam. Verse 11 says, the false people abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. Now, Balaam's error was that he was greedy for gain. He was even willing to allow his own family, his own people to suffer so that he could have financial and social influence. In fact, Balaam's situation got so bad that God literally spoke through the mouth of a donkey to confront him for his greed. Greed for money and influence are patterns of false living. Third Old Testament example is Korah's rebellion. This is another wild story. This is, these are great stories. Don't let anyone tell you while you're reading through the Old Testament, by the way, that the book of Numbers is just some boring accounting book in the Bible with lots of names and numbers. It is, has some of the best, most riveting stories in the scriptures, and one of them is right here, Korah's rebellion, Numbers 16, and the story goes something like this. Korah and his followers are grumbling and complaining against Moses and the elders' leadership of Israel. So God ends up having Moses and his followers over here, and he has Korah and his followers that are rebellious separate. They're apart from each other. And then what happens is, I think this is so cool, the earth literally opens, creepy but cool, the earth opens up and swallows Korah and all of his followers. And then the text in Numbers 16 says that they go down alive to hell. It clarifies that. And then it says the earth closes back over them. All because they disrespected Moses and the elders. Whoa. And I love how Israel responds to this event. Numbers 16.34 says they run away immediately saying, Lest the earth swallow us up too. That should be our response to this passage here in Jude. We should recognize our own propensity toward these patterns of false living, and we should do something about it. Three actions, three Old Testament examples. Now Jude's going to rapid fire six examples from nature. So hang with me. Put your eyes on verse 12. False people, he says, are like hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. Love feast is uh, another name for communion at the time. So these people are then taking communion without fear, without repenting of their sin. Why? Because they think that they're saved, that they're Christians, that they're good to go. So they're taking communion without repenting of sin, without fear. And, in, and uh, it says in the same way that hidden ocean reefs can tear up the bottom of ships that don't see them. So these people, though they're hidden, can tear up fellowship in the church. Second, text says they're shepherds feeding themselves. The word shepherd means to care for, which is what was supposed to be happening at these love feasts as they sit down to have a meal and eat communion together. They're supposed to be caring for and serving, shepherding one another, and yet these people care for only themselves. So they could be likened to consumers in the church who come just to be fed, but not to serve and to love on and disciple other people in the church. Third, they are waterless clouds, 
swept along by winds. So in the hot summer months in Israel, man, even the last couple months that we've had here in Ohio, a cloud can promise some great shade and some great rain to just cool you down for once. And yet these clouds bring no rain. They look on the outside like promisingly good Christians, but it turns out they are unstable and blown away by the wind, living falsely. Fourth, they're like fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Notice that Jude says it's late autumn. So it's like the end of the fall, apple picking season is coming to an end. You should have already picked your bushels with your family, and yet there are these trees over here who still haven't borne any fruit. That's what these false people are like. He says they're twice dead. They're dead in their evil works that they're doing, yes, but there's also this reality of a second death coming for them that the book of Revelation talks about, that they won't just die physically, but they're going to die spiritually and be judged into the outer darkness apart from Christ. Fifth, they are wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. Listen, There's no peace of mind for those who have hidden patterns of false living. If this is you, things are constantly being tossed around on the inside like wild waves, and you know that eventually the foam of your own shame is going to be cast up. Sixth, they're wandering or erring stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Sounds familiar. Remember, Eternal darkness is the penalty for false living. And now we've recognized 12 patterns of false living. Remember, recognize, and now repent. Third, repent before the judgment on false living. Repent before the judgment on false living. So I don't know if you think about this each day, but every one of us is going to have to stand before the judgment throne of God Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you're going to stand before his judgment throne and you're going to have to give an account for every work, whether good or bad, that you've done in your body. And the Bible is very clear when it says nothing is going to remain hidden on that day. It will all be uncovered. Everything that's secret will be known and brought into the light. There's no avoiding this. There's no two ways about this. So you're eternally better off to repent and reveal any false living that you have in your life now than to wait and have it be revealed for the first time before the judgment throne of God. Look at verse 14. Jude says, It was also about false people that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all. And to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against God. Yikes. This passage is overwhelming. It's saying there's going to be not just Archangel Michael who can defeat the devil, but 10,000 angels are going to be there on that judgment day. And there's going to be judgment on all ungodliness. That word all is repeated four times in the text. I don't know if you caught it. It says God will judge all. He will convict all the ungodly of how many of their righteous deeds? Unrighteous deeds. All of them. Of how many of their ungodly words and tones? All of them. No sin will be left uncovered. Not even a single sinful word or attitude will be left hidden. So who of us can stand in the judgment? When Romans 3 says that all have sinned, it agrees that we fall short of the glory of God. I told you this is hard news in the book of Jude. In case you were still thinking this passage is about those sinners over there, I mean, I would never be found in any of these 12 patterns of sin. Well, Jude adds verse 16 to truly throw us all under the bus. Look at verse 16. He says, These people are grumblers. We're all guilty now, aren't we? Malcontents. So people who find fault with things. Critical people, they're discontented with how things are. If you have a perfectionist personality like me, you're feeling this a little extra. Next it says they're following their own sinful desires. We've all done that. That's just the definition of sin. 
It says, they are loud-mouthed boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. Ooh, man, no one is off the hook now. It's almost a, a catch-22 here. Even if you thought you would never be like any of those 12 patterns before, well, then if you were to say that, you'd be in the category now of loud-mouthed boasting, which is like the Pharisees who held themselves up as moral and theological exemplars for everyone to follow in their community, and yet they were never heard admitting any kind of present imperfection in their lives. Boasting. It's all false living of one kind or another. So what do you do when this passage inevitably convicts you of your false living? You repent before the coming judgment on false living. Maybe you even realize today that you've never truly repented of sin before because the pattern of your life does not show that saving grace works. And if that's so, I've got really, really good news for you today. It's that the judgment hasn't happened yet. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Listen, God could come back at any moment and there would not be any more second chances to repent of your sin. No second chances for salvation after that. It could be 30 seconds from right now and bam, that's it. That's the end. But God hasn't come back yet. Why? Because he loves you. Because he's patient towards you. Because he wants you to come to repentance today. He wants you to turn from your own patterns of false living and to go running into the arms of Jesus and to find that saving grace works. He wants you to run and put all your faith, all your hope, all your life, all your joy in the basket of Jesus. Jesus who is himself true life. Jesus who himself lived the perfect sinless life that we should have lived with no hidden imperfections. Jesus who himself deserved no penalty at all for how he lived. And yet who himself chose to take on the full judgment of outer darkness on your behalf so that today you could put your faith in his finished work alone and find that saving grace works. If saving grace is already at work in your life this morning, commentator Doug Moo says, Jude's reminder that Christ is coming to judge ungodliness should create in you not a smug satisfaction that we're not among those to be condemned, it should stimulate each of us to ask about the ungodliness that is still too much a part of our own lives. Remembering the judgment for sin should lead us to recognize our own weak areas, which should lead us to repentance, running towards Jesus, saving grace that works because Christ is working in you. So earlier I read from 1 Corinthians 6 and it listed off a ton of descriptions of false living of sin that categorized all of us. But Paul then says that if you are a part of the true church, you've been changed by grace. He says, verse 11, and such were some of you. That's not who you are anymore. Man, oh, that our church would then be filled with people who can readily admit that they were former sinners, they were former adulterers, former homosexuals, former greedy people, former Pharisees, former ungodly people of all kinds who've been changed into godly saints by the blood of Jesus and who are being changed daily because saving grace works. So whatever pattern of false living that you might be tempted towards this week, whether you're living in victory over that pattern or you're in failure or you're somewhere in between, Jude wants you this morning to consider the propensity you might have to that temptation. He wants you to remember it, to recognize it, and to repent of it running headlong into the mercy of Jesus today. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this difficult passage of scripture to remind us before you return that there is a penalty for false living. So Lord, I ask that by the grace of your Holy Spirit, you'd help each one of us to be able to humbly recognize those areas in our own life where you are pointing the finger and convicting us and, and wanting us to turn and run to you. So change us, God. 
by Jesus' life lived on our behalf to no longer walk according to the flesh, but to walk according to the Spirit, that if you were to return today, Lord, that we would be ready and rejoicing that we get to see our Savior face to face, because there's nothing better than knowing you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.